He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, ko William Ray tēnei, no mai ki te hipi pāngo. Hi there, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep. This is the story of Victor Penny's death ray. The story begins early in 1935, late in the evening at 19 Wynyard Street in Devonport on Auckland's North Shore. These days, 19 Wynyard Street is a lighting store across the road from Hammer Hardware. But in the 1930s, this spot had a big fancy residence, the home of a rich old businessman and former British Army officer, Colonel William Holgate. Out front is a huge garage with a flat in the second storey. And even though it's late, there's still the glow of electric lights flickering out the windows and between the cracks in the door. Inside, a man's hunched over a workbench. He's short but powerfully built with a bull chest and an intense expression. His name is Victor Penny. And up until recently, he and his wife had rented the flat above Colonel Holgate's garage. Victor kind of worked for Colonel Holgate. He managed the bus depot in Takapuna, and Holgate was the chairman of the company which owned it. While the pennies were living over his garage, Colonel Holgate had been impressed with Victor. He was intelligent and hard-working. In his spare time, he never stopped tinkering with radios, microphones and other mechanisms. So even after Victor Penny and his wife shifted out of the flat above his garage to a house in Takapuna, Holgate said Victor could keep using his garage for experiments. Tonight, Victor Penny's all alone in the garage, hunched over his latest invention. It's an electronic device, a bunch of wires and tubes connected to an antenna. Victor leans back and stretches, He fishes a cigarette out of his pocket and takes a match from the packet on his desk. He takes a drag, then hunches back over the device. He flips a switch. Victor Penny stares at his desk in disbelief. Seemingly out of nowhere, his packet of matches has burst into flames. Now, I told you this was a story, right? Well, it's a story that first appeared in the Auckland Star on June 22nd, 1935. And it was based on an interview with Victor Penny's lawyer. According to the Star, this lawyer said... Six months ago, Mr Penny told me that quite by accident he exploded a box of matches with an invisible electric ray with which he was experimenting. He could hardly believe his senses and tried the thing over and over again until he exploded another box of matches. But over time, the lawyer said Victor became uneasy about his device. Mr Penny told me that the experiment was becoming too dangerous as he could not control the apparatus. He said it was only fear which made him discontinue the experiments as the electrical equipment had a backward as well as a forward kick in it. I knew he also experimented and successfully blew up cordite which was buried two feet in the ground. You might be wondering, why was the Auckland Star talking to Victor Penny's lawyer about these experiments and not to the inventor himself? Well, because Victor Penny was in hospital and his room was being guarded day and night by the police. Two nights earlier, Victor had been found badly beaten at his workplace, the Takapuna bus depot. According to a witness, he was half-conscious, moaning about secret plans. Rumours flew, and it didn't take long until newspapers were speculating the Auckland inventor had been attacked by someone looking to steal one of his inventions. One report in circulation is that one of Mr Penny's inventions is so revolutionary in effect that it would be sought after by a foreign power, and that the reason high police officials are making secret inquiries in Auckland is that the whole affair has an international significance. 
The cops in Auckland were bombarded with questions and requests for interviews. The commissioner of police tried to dismiss the sensational reports, but the rumour mill didn't stop grinding. After all, if this story about a secret invention and foreign powers wasn't true, why were the cops guarding Victor Penny's hospital bed? Then, within a few weeks of this assault, Victor Penny vanished from the headlines and also from the city of Auckland. All questions about this mysterious assault went unanswered for more than six months. And if it had all ended here, it'd be a weird story, but nothing special. But then, about half a year after the assault on Victor Penny, there was a huge revelation. The government confirmed that Victor had been taken from hospital and sent to a military facility on Matthew Soames Island in the middle of Wellington Harbour. It's a place that's most famous as an internment camp and a quarantine station. He'd also spent some time at a military base at Fort Dorset in Setun, overlooking the mouth of Whanganui Atara. Nobody could say why Victor had been taken to the island, or why the inventor was being guarded 24-7 by soldiers with orders to shoot anyone who approached him. One of the guards even slept in Victor's bedroom, escorting him to and from the toilet with a loaded rifle, bayonet fixed and ready. Decades later, one of these soldiers was interviewed by the press newspaper. He said, We were very serious about this, you know. We had to ring around the house with barbed wire. At the time, nobody could explain why Victor Penny was so heavily, intensively, seriously guarded. But that didn't stop the papers speculating. The Auckland Star laid out its theory in a lengthy article published in March 1936. Although the exact nature of the invention is unknown, it's believed that Mr Penny, like several inventors in Europe, hopes to be able to prove to the satisfaction of the defence authorities that he can transmit powerful electric current, perhaps in the form of an invisible ray without wires, to stop men and aeroplanes in flight and paralyse transport. The Auckland Star ended its report with a tantalising quote from Victor Penny's mother. In his last letter to me, my son said he hoped soon to be a free agent and that he would see me soon. He also told me that I would soon receive a big surprise. You've got to imagine the readers of the star were waiting with bated breath for that big surprise. A white cloth whipped away to reveal some kind of new super weapon. A deadly death ray lancing out beams of energy, turning fleets of German bombers to burning wreckage. But that's not how things played out. Partway through Victor's time on Matsu Soames Island, the government had changed hands. It seems to me, ladies and gentlemen, that at last in New Zealand, Labour has the opportunity of giving effect to principles that have been near and dear to most of us for the greater part of a lifetime. And shortly after the Auckland Star published its big story about Victor Penny, Michael Joseph Savage's new Labour government released a public statement. They said they'd investigated Victor's experiments, and they weren't impressed. The following year, 1937, the police minister and future prime minister Peter Fraser ridiculed the previous government for employing Victor Penny in the first place. He said... We found that the man was still under guard and still searching for his mythical death ray at a cost to the country of a thousand pounds. When we questioned the poor fellow, a child could have seen that there was nothing in it. It it was as good as a bedtime story on the radio. (laughs) But infuriatingly, While Peter Fraser notably used those words, death ray, he never did tell the full story. And this is basically where things have been ever since. Journalists and historians have occasionally revisited the story of Victor Penny's death ray, but nobody ever seems to uncover new information. 
The only exception I found was in 1984 when Gary Arthur, a reporter for the Press newspaper, tracked down some of the people who were on Matthew Soames with Victor Penny and asked what they made of his experiments. One of the soldiers who guarded Victor Penny, Len Barnes, said he saw him using a device to burn holes in slices of meat. But he wasn't all that impressed by it. Barnes said the device was a radio diathermy thing that they used to cut up steak without a knife. I never saw Penny explode anything. Radio diathermy is a medical technique which uses electrical devices to heat, cut and cauterise tissue. It was first developed in the 1920s and it's still used today. But it only works at extremely short range. You can't use radio diathermy to ignite matches from across the room, let alone blow up buried explosives. But the most cutting quotes in the press's 1984 article came from a guard called Eric Ortrich. Before he joined the army, he'd been an amateur radio enthusiast. And he said... Penny's death ray I recognise as a circuit from QST, a monthly publication for the American Radio Relay League. The circuit, Eric Ortridge said, wasn't a new invention. And while it could be used to build a powerful radio transmitter, it was nothing that could blast a bomber out of the sky. I picked up he was bluffing. He reckoned the Germans were chasing him. Actually, I think he was chasing some bloke's wife. And that bloke knocked him out. So, some dismissed Victor Penny as a fantasist. But here's the thing. Nearly 90 years after the fact, huge chunks of the story remain a complete mystery. When I started my research for this podcast, I found heaps of newspaper reports on the saga of Victor Penny's death ray. And after I read all those newspaper reports, I went to Archives New Zealand, hoping to track down some more official sources of information. I requested any old files about Penny from the police, defence, the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. I even went digging through Peter Fraser's old personal correspondence. Here we are, 1936. Each page I turned, I was hoping the answer would be there. Maybe a police report outlining what had happened in that assault at the Takapuna bus station. Maybe that cabinet document from February 1936, which led to Victor's dismissal from his work on Matthew Soane's Island. Not what I'm after. Unfortunately, no such luck. OK, here I am leaving archives. I found absolutely nothing. And that complete absence of official records seems bizarre. Because documents must have been written about this. We know Victor Penny's assault was investigated by some of Auckland's top detectives. And we know the Defence Force kept him under guard for six months at a military facility. This sort of stuff does not happen without generating paperwork. So where is it? Well, Archives explained it like this when I emailed them asking that exact question. We have nothing listed for Victor Penny in our police or DSIR lists and only a personnel file for the war service of someone of that name in the NZDF lists. But this does not mean we don't hold anything as there could be information contained in the general or correspondence files of these departments. Our files are only listed to title level and frustratingly this often gives little insight into their contents. So the Penny files almost certainly existed, and maybe they still do exist. They could be sitting anonymously in a giant room full of boxes, but there's no way of working out which box they're in. It's kind of like that scene at the end of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they hide the Ark of the Covenant in a nondescript wooden box in a warehouse full of other wooden boxes. The truth of the matter is still to come out. I mean, archives are probably sitting on material that the public can't yet get access to. This is David McGill, a journalist and author who first came across Victor Penny's story about a decade ago. And he thinks there's more to this than tabloid nonsense. He had the blueprints for lasers and radar very early on in the piece, and he was on the right track. David McGill wrote a historical fiction book about Victor Penny's death ray. It's called The Death Ray Debacle. 
David McGill got the idea for that work of historical fiction from his work on a previous history book, Island of Secrets. It's all about the people who were interned on Matthew Soames during the Second World War, which is an interesting story in its own right. He was just a footnote, actually, when I was doing the Soames Island story, because the Nazis totally preoccupied me. (laughs) But um, uh, for some reason, he lingered on in my head, and I thought, I wonder if I can track him down. Mm. And and the big breakthrough, as, as you've seen, was when I managed to find his son. Victor Penny's son, Evan Penny, is fascinated by his father's mysterious experiments. But as he explained when I called him up at his home in Fitianga, it's a story that was kept secret even within the family. Vic was a secretive old squirrel when it came to this sort of thing. I didn't get any of this from Victor. He wouldn't speak about it. I got it from my mother. Evan's mother, Grace Penny, passed these stories on to Evan in the 1960s when he went off to study science and engineering at Otago University. Her argument was... You're doing physics now, you should, you know, you might understand some of this stuff. And indeed, I learned stuff at university. I didn't know that it was connected with the father's research until after I sat down and thought about it. Evan has a lot of extraordinary stories about his dad, and potentially they fill in some of the gaps in this mystery. But we need to tread a bit carefully, because we all know how family stories can be misremembered or exaggerated over the years. And an important thing to know is that Grace Penny was Victor's second wife. They married in the 1940s after Victor's first wife died of cancer. Some of the events Grace described to Evan are probably things she herself heard secondhand, either from Victor or someone else. Anyway, with those caveats in place, let's wind back and try and fill in a few of the gaps in the story of Victor Penny. Evan says his dad arrived in New Zealand around the year 1900. Victor was about four years old at the time. The Penny Farno came from Bournemouth in the south of England. Victor's own father had made horse-drawn coaches, and he once told Evan he could remember watching his own dad building up endless layers of varnish and hand-painted gold trim on the exterior. Victor had an assortment of jobs. For a while, he was a firefighter. Later, he was a refrigerator and radio repairman. And, of course, he also worked at the North Shore Bus Company, managing the Takapuna Depot. He didn't serve in combat during the First World War, although not for lack of trying. You know, he tried to volunteer for the First World War under age. And he was marching down Queen Street to the troop ship to be off to Gallipoli. When his granny went up to the um, marshalling officer said, that boy is underage. Yeah, son, fall out. <laughs> so he, he was refused his chance to go to the First World War, and then he was too old to go to the Second World War. Between the wars, Victor Penny developed a fascination with electronics. Evan says he had a natural talent for designing circuits and building equipment. I never went to secondary school, but he's a bright bastard. Really, really bright, and did not suffer fools gladly. Unfortunately, quite a few people wound up in the fools basket. But <laughs> well, that can happen when you're a very smart person, can't it? I mean, you, oh, sort of, yes. you sort of see this with some people who are just, yeah, like you say, very intelligent, but sort of can't deal with anyone who's not on their level. Uh, or someone who tells him he's wrong, without any good reason for it being wrong. There's one story Evan says perfectly illustrates this aspect of Victor's character. His smarts with electronics landed him a job setting up a transmitter array for one of Auckland's early radio stations. But when it started broadcasting, Victor noticed there was something wrong. The gain was a bit low in the mid-frequencies, meaning older listeners might struggle to hear the broadcast. He told his manager he needed to make a few tweaks to fix it. No, 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 said the manager. And those were in the good old days when the managers knew absolutely nothing about radio transmission, let alone how to build radio amplifiers and things. Oh, yes, yes, says Vic. I'll just have to tune. No, 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 you touch it and you're fired. So Vic had a temper on him, so he wound up getting fired. So I thought... Right, you bastards. 
So he went down to Turnbull and Jones, as he called them, Grumbles and Groans. That's an electronics store, by the way. And then bought himself a whole drum of transformer wire, which is insulated copper wire, from building transformers, and he mounted that on top of his car, which is a Ford Prefect, I think, and connected the two ends to a light bulb. And he drove backwards and forwards over the hills in front of the antenna array above Mission Bay until the light bulb lit up. As Evan tells the story, Victor knew the antenna he'd helped build were directional, so the radio waves were focused to a point before spreading out. Victor parked his car exactly at that point where the signal converged and set up his antenna. So instead of going out to all the radio sets across the city, the signal from the transmitters was being redirected by the antenna on the roof of his car. The phone just rang off the hook. I can't hear the station. I can't hear the station. I spent me money buying a receiver and putting up an area on I can't hear the station. The station manager sent a policeman to see what was going on because he could see Vic's car. And the policeman drove up on his bicycle and he said, Oh, are you Vic Penny? Yes, yes, I'm Vic Penny. What are you doing? I'm just sitting here having a smoke and reading the paper. Oh, well, we've had a complaint from the station manager that you're blocking the transmission. Victor pointed out he hadn't even touched the antenna, so he couldn't be accused of vandalising it. And the cop, apparently, was kind of stumped. The policeman just couldn't find a reason to make Vic move on. Anyway, the long and the short of it is he got his job back. (laughs) Moved his car and the transmission resumed and... Now, is this story true? Well, I talked to some of the radio technicians at RNZ. It's their job to maintain those giant radio masts you see dotted around the country. They were very sceptical that you could redirect or block a radio broadcast in the way Evan described. They said Victor's setup could potentially interfere with a highly directional shortwave transmitter... The problem is, those aren't the kind of transmitters that are typically used by radio stations. But that whole thing about Victor having a spool of wire connected to a light bulb, which lit up when he parked next to the transmitter, that part of the story definitely checks out. Our radio stations put out a lot of power. Um, So if you can gather a reasonable amount of it in and pop it through a light bulb, it's quite feasible that it will glow, yes. This is Rodney Vaughan. He's a professor of engineering at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. He originally studied at Canterbury University and has a long interest in the history of radio and radar technology in New Zealand. And he says you can even try this glowing light bulb thing out at home. Certainly if you take a light bulb, an incandescent one, not, a, not one of these lead ones, but an incandescent one, if you just pop it in the microwave, it probably will glow, and if it doesn't, just solder a small wire, just a couple of centimetres long, a uh, pair of wires onto the two, um, two terminals of the light bulb, and it glows very happily. RNZ's legal department would like me to stress that kids should absolutely not do this experiment without adult supervision. So certainly parts of the story are possible, but maybe some parts got a bit lost in transmission, if you'll allow me a terrible radio pun. But there are concrete examples of Victor Penny inventing sophisticated devices. Archives New Zealand still holds the patent he filed for an advanced new type of microphone. Yeah, capacitive microphone, which doesn't amaze anybody today, but it was a blinding innovation then because the electronics required to convert the capacitive change into uh, speech or any other kind of sound was quite innovative. But typical of Vic, he didn't make any money out of it. Not a razoo. He just wasn't like that. Evan says his dad wasn't motivated by money, but instead by a fascination with technical problems and by a strong sense of patriotism. Evan says this encouraged his dad to look at technological solutions to military problems, including the problem of how to navigate underwater in a submarine. The problem was, the steel hull of a submarine acts as a shield against the Earth's magnetic field. So the submarine had to surface to take a magnetic fix on north. 
So, Victor Penny thought to himself, what if instead of using the Earth's magnetic field to point a compass needle, he used a gyroscope? Gyroscopes work according to Newton's third law, the conservation of momentum. Basically, a spinning object will keep spinning in the same direction unless some outside force acts on it. Victor's idea was that if you point a gyroscope north and spin it up, then put it in a kind of gimbaled cage with an electric motor to keep it spinning, it will keep pointing north. And you can use it just like an ordinary compass. Now, he didn't know too much about whether this would work or not, but anyway, he built one. And he and his brother Val took it down to Weymouth. Val was to swim out some distance into the water (laughs) and dive with this box and turn it round and round and backwards and forwards and do flips and loops and things and bring it back to shore and see whether it was still pointing north. And lo and behold, it was. Victor Penny wasn't the first to invent a gyroscopic compass, but it would still be pretty impressive for a self-taught engineer like Victor to come up with his own design independently. Victor Penny took his device to the New Zealand Navy, but they weren't all that impressed. They just said, this is of no practical value to us. Mm. So he sent it by surface mail all the way to London by ship, the plans. And according to my mother, some eight or nine months after that, got a knock on the door and here's Constable Plod. Oh, Constable so-and-so, here you, Val, uh, Victor George Penny. Yes, um, I'm under instructions from the Ministry of Defence. You, you have produced a thing called a gyroscopic compass. <laughs> Struggle to pronounce it. You are to surrender all plans, all prototypes, all parts, parts in process of manufacture, assemblies, part assemblies. You know, this great long list of only a lawyer would write and um, cease and forth with and discuss it with no one, and disclose your plans to no one. And Evan says his dad took the rejection pretty hard. Vic was so angry, he took the prototype out to the chopping block and with an axe cut this solid steel motor in half. Took him 20 minutes. He cut it in half. (laughs) My mother said she was scared he would do himself an injury. He was so angry. But... Evan says his father kept up his experiments and increasingly became focused on a strange phenomenon he'd noticed while listening to the radio. You know, the the signal would fade in and fade out. So in the old radio sets, you'd be listening away, disappear, and then come back full strength, and then disappear again, faded backwards and forwards. And he wanted to know what was causing that. What was causing it was the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a part of the Earth's atmosphere made up of ionised gas. And in the early 20th century, people figured out you could bounce radio waves off this ionised gas to send signals extremely long distances. With the right gear, people in New Zealand can sometimes listen to radio stations being broadcast as far away as the United States. At first, it was assumed the ionosphere was relatively static, but we now know it has multiple layers which get pushed around by solar wind. It's these shifting layers which sometimes cause the radio signals to break up in the way Evan was describing. But in Victor's time, that phenomenon wasn't fully understood. So he thought, I will bounce a radio pulse straight up and measure the time it takes to come down again. But um, what he got back was not like ping from his transmitter and ping a ping back. He got ping, 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 ping. He got a series of returns. And he tried to interest the university in this. He said there's not one layer. There's actually a multiplicity of layers, and indeed there is. But that was not the given theory of the day. So again, he was poo-pooed and basically told to go away. Victor gets another rejection, but he kept playing around with radio and seems to have become reasonably well known as an expert on this technology. Unfortunately, the reporters who interviewed Victor Penny about this tech may not have fully understood the explanations Victor gave them. 
And this, Evan thinks, is where the idea of a so-called death ray got started. He got interviewed by a reporter, probably from the Auckland Herald or someone, and wanted to know about radio waves. What are they, these radio things? They're called wireless sets, and you have to look in the back, and it's full of wires. You know, what do you mean by wireless? And, of course, he means that it means there's, there's no wire between the station and your set. So Vic gave him an example. He said, I could put a bomb on top of One Tree Hill, which we could see from our house in top of St Andrews Road, and press a button and it would detonate the bomb, you know, just with a remote control. And then out came the news item, Penny invents death ray. Hmm. No, he didn't. Unfortunately, I can't track down the article Evan is describing to confirm this story. Nothing like it shows up in a search of papers past. That's the online newspaper archive. I can believe this kind of mistake could happen, though, and it's a good explanation for the reports of Victor detonating buried explosives. But it only solves part of the story. It doesn't explain the accounts of Victor setting matchbooks on fire. Multiple people talk about Victor setting matchbooks on fire at a distance using some kind of device, and it doesn't sound like that was something he was doing using a remote control. Even Penny thinks this might have been another radio experiment his dad was working on. He tried to um, build this uh, two kilowatt transmitter. He would set up a box of matches in front of the uh, transmitting uh, cone. Boom, off went the box of matches. Now, two kilowatts was a hell of a lot of electricity for an amateur to be playing around with back in those days. Potentially, it's a dangerous amount of energy, but it depends on the situation. Like, there's a good chance that you have a two kilowatt heater in your house, and that's perfectly safe because the power is being distributed over a large area. But if you concentrate the energy, and that's a different story, a two kilowatt industrial laser will cut clean through a sheet of metal. We don't have any blueprints, so we don't know how Victor Penny's 2 kilowatt device worked. Based on Evan's story, it sounds a lot more powerful than your average radio transmitter. You know, so he was doing all sorts of experiments until he burnt his first wife's leg with this. So 2 kilowatts concentrated in a couple of square inches on her leg. She got third-degree burns on her leg. Again, I put this to a few experts... And they had some reservations with these stories of exploding matchbooks and burned wives. Here's Professor Rodney Vaughan again. That would take an enormous amount of radio power if, if it was a radio power burn. Um, it takes an enormous amount of power to get flesh, if you like, hot enough to burn, much more than a microwave oven. And you'd have to have a very, very directive antenna which would focus it at a place. And that antenna would have to be really big. Like how big? I'd have to do some calculations, but I couldn't see it being less than maybe 5 or 10 metres in diameter, something like that. Something that people would notice at a demonstration. Professor Vaughan actually wondered if Victor's wife might have been burned by an ordinary electric shock rather than anything exotic. As for the story of setting matchbooks on fire, is that possible? You'd need a massive amount of power, even a box of matches. Uh, You can pop it into your microwave, if you like, and... Just try zapping it for a while. Again, for the sake of RNZ's legal department, please do not try this experiment at home. It could well if you get enough phosphorus from the, you know, from the match heads and put it in a big bundle and run it in the microwave long enough. It probably would burst into flames ultimately just from the heat that it absorbs from the microwave. But you can't get that kind of power density 16 feet away from a, a source. Once you're 16 feet away from it, you know, your power is in fractions like thousands or even millions of what the source power is, in other words, the microwave magnetron. So that's extremely unlikely to happen. It's even more unlikely when you consider that Victor Penny wasn't even using microwaves to burn matches. He was using ordinary radio waves, which carry far less energy. And these stories sound even more dubious when you realise none of them seem to come from eyewitnesses. As the Evening Post reported... Auckland residents connected with Mr Penny in the various experiments he has conducted in radio and other electrical work have heard allegations of a mysterious force said to have been discovered by him in the course of his researches. 
Nobody can be found, however, who has ever seen the force exhibited, although rumours as to its effects are numerous. To be clear, I'm not saying Victor Petty never set a matchbook on fire, and neither is Rodney Vaughan. We don't have the blueprints for Victor's juiced-up radio transmitter, so it's hard to say for sure what it was and wasn't capable of. But as Professor Rodney Vaughan explains, there are less dramatic explanations for how a matchbook might spontaneously combust. Could have been a case of the matchbox being sitting on some of the equipment that was just getting really hot. You know, the uh, tubes and that sort of stuff and the electronics that drives them, the power supply, they, they could have got hot. And if you just happened to have a box of matches sitting on a particularly hot spot, <laughs> maybe that could cause it, but that's speculation. Okay, so I know this podcast has death ray in the title, so let's talk a bit more about death rays, because it actually helps explain the story if you understand a bit of the wider context. In the 1930s, a lot of people were talking about the possibility of weaponizing high power rays of energy, and it was also in popular culture. Death rays were a big feature of old sci-fi comics like Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers, which started being published in the 1920s and 30s. Way back in the 1890s, there was the famous Heat Ray from The War of the Worlds, later famously adapted into a radio play by Orson Welles. The automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty... But it wasn't just science fiction. Some of the world's top scientists were talking seriously about these weapons, including Dr Nikola Tesla, the famous early pioneer of electricity. For the final few decades of his life, Dr Tesla told anyone who would listen about his efforts to invent something he called teleforce. But the newspapers described as a death beam, because, you know, it's a better name. A year before Victor Penny's death ray hit the headlines in New Zealand, the New York Times published an interview with Dr. Tesla about his teleforce. This death beam, Dr. Tesla said, will send concentrated beams of particles through the free air of such tremendous energy that they will bring down a fleet of 10,000 enemy airplanes at a distance of 250 miles from a defending nation's border. Dr. Tesla wasn't the only famous inventor talking about deadly beams of energy. The Italian scientist who invented the wireless telegraph, Gamo Marconi, also claimed to be working on a death ray, and German and Japanese scientists both tried to develop beam weapons during the Second World War. Of course, all these attempts failed, and it's tempting to look back and scoff at these people as delusional. But we've got to remember, the 1930s were a time of bewildering scientific advancement. In just a few decades, people had moved from a world of mailed letters and horse-drawn carts to a world of wireless radio, automobiles and aeroplanes. In a couple more decades, we'd have rockets blasting into space and atomic bombs flattening cities. In that context, death rays didn't seem like such a huge technological leap. Even if Victor Penny's death ray never existed, someone may have taken the rumours seriously enough to try and steal it. On June 20th, 1935, subscribers to the Auckland Star newspaper woke up to this headline. Attacked. Cries for help. Radio experimenter man found semi-conscious. The Auckland Star quoted a Mr and Mrs McNeil who found the injured inventor and said he was calling out for my papers, my papers, and rambling about a sawn-off shotgun. It noted this attack didn't seem like an ordinary robbery. Victor Penny still had money in his pockets. A reporter went door-to-door asking neighbours what they thought had happened. What were these papers Victor Penny was yelling about? The suggestion that Mr Penny was robbed of valuable drawings or plans of a radio invention which he was about to patent was made in Takapuna this morning. It has been known for some time that Mr Penny had been working on a new type of condenser microphone with a built-in preamplifier, of which he had great hopes of success. The next day, June 21st, the Star printed even more dramatic rumours. 
One report in circulation is that one of Mr Penny's inventions is so revolutionary in its effect that it would be sought after by a foreign power and that the reason high police officials are making secret inquiries in Auckland is that the whole affair has an international significance. This may be but a rumour, but those who have learned some of the facts are not inclined to discount it heavily. The fact that the police are still guarding Mr Penny's laboratory gives good ground for the belief that there is much more in the matter than has so far been disclosed. A big break in the story came about a week after the attack, when the Auckland Star interviewed Colonel William Holgate. Remember, he was the chair of the company where Victor Penny worked and also his former landlord. Colonel Holgate said that he knew Penny had been experimenting with an invisible ray of the nature of the death ray, of which so much was recently heard in Europe. Penny's ray, he understood, could explode a box of matches 16 feet away from the apparatus he was experimenting with. Then, Colonel Holgate told the star something even more interesting. A few days before the attack, a mysterious man came to Colonel Holgate's house asking his maid about the former tenant who lived above his garage. According to Colonel Holgate, the man was most anxious to know where he could find Penny. On being told that he no longer occupied a flat above the garage in Wynyard Street, the stranger asked where Penny was living. He was given an address at Napier Avenue, Takapuna. I am firmly convinced that last Wednesday's assault on Penny was definitely associated with one of Penny's inventions, concluded Colonel Holgate. Up till this point, the police had kept their lips tightly sealed about anything related to Victor Penny's attack. But the interview with Colonel Holgate seems to have provoked the Commissioner of Police, Ward George Wallman, to respond. And, well, he essentially mocked the newspapers for printing all these sensational stories. Really, this mystery is quite one of the best for some time. It seems such good copy coming as it does at this quiet season that I'm reluctant to say anything that it may spoil even this penny, half-penny effort to drive away dull care. We've all heard of the Loch Ness Monster, but many reasonably well-balanced people venture to doubt its existence. But as David McGill points out, while the police dismiss the rumours surrounding Victor Penny's attack, the central mystery was never resolved. So who attacked him? We still don't know. Nobody's fessed up to it. The police records relating to this assault cannot be found. So we don't know what leads the cops might have had. The most mundane explanation is this was just a random attack. Maybe someone tried to mug Victor, got scared and ran off without taking anything. But Colonel Holgate was convinced the attack came from someone trying to steal Victor's secret inventions. And that remains a possibility. Because when the papers wrote about shadowy foreign agents operating in Auckland, they were actually on to something. Around the same time Victor was assaulted, Auckland police were becoming increasingly concerned about covert Nazi activity in the city. German society in Auckland had been taken over by the Nazis and they were taking down the names of every person of German origin, either to call them into the uh, armed forces of Germany, or if they were Jews, of course, to take them somewhere else. After the Second World War ended, the police wrote a report outlining their investigations of the Auckland German Club. Members commenced the club's proceedings by saying Heil Hitler and giving the Nazi salute before a large framed portrait of Hitler. The club had about 50 members in 1935, and that membership included some dedicated Nazis. So it's possible one of these people heard the rumours about Victor Penny's inventions and decided it was in Germany's interests to steal his plans. But there's reasons to be sceptical. Because surely if the police suspected this assault in Takapuna was carried out by a Nazi agent, they would have mentioned it in their big report all about Auckland's Nazis. And Victor Penny's name doesn't appear once in that report. Then again, if there was nothing particularly significant about the assault, 
Why did the government take the extraordinary step of shipping Victor Penny off to Matthew Soames Island, seemingly to work on something top secret? In the absence of official documents, we can only really speculate. Everyone at the time seems to have latched onto this idea of him building a death ray. But funnily enough, Evan Penny doesn't think that's what his dad was doing. Evan reckons his dad was working on something a lot of other people were working on at the time, especially the British. They were in the process, like a number of any number of other foreign governments, busily of trying to get radar to work. As far back as the 1880s, scientists had realised that you could bounce radio waves off metal objects. As early as the 1910s and 20s, people were experimenting with the military applications of this, trying to detect aircraft and ships from very long distances. But there was a problem. It was relatively easy to use reflected radio waves to detect which direction an object was in. But it was extremely difficult to figure out how far away it was. Radio waves travel at different speeds through the air depending on the frequency. So if you want to do a ranging exercise to sort of work out the range between you and an approaching aeroplane, the frequency has to be rock solid. Otherwise, you imagine the old-fashioned pictures of uh, air traffic controller, radar screens, the picture would balloon in and out, expand and contract, expand and contract, depending on whether someone left the door open or not. What was needed was a way to stabilise the frequency. This was the work he was taken to Soames Island for. He tried very, very hard, all sorts of ingenious ways to get his circuit to stay on frequency. There was all sorts of bullshit stories put about, about what he was doing there to hide the fact that he was working on prototype radar because this was highly top secret stuff. I have to stress, this is only a theory from Evan. But if it is true, it wouldn't actually be anything that unusual. There were a lot of people all over the world beavering away with weird and wonderful radio experiments in the 1920s and 30s, including a lot of self-taught amateurs. The ham community was a buzz with all the sorts of stuff. For instance, he was investigating being able to shut down the motor on a petrol car remotely because this was one of the ideas floating around the ham radio community. And I think if I was the government, I'd be really concerned in in the same way that the internet now is of concern in Mm. that it... um, allows all sorts of ideas to rocket around the ether, even ideas which are to the detriment of the country's security. That's kind of a good analogy, isn't it? It's sort of like these sort of, you know, open source hackers who who go out and and they might even know more about hacking than the government does. Absolutely. Absolutely. To even Penny, this explains why his dad was taken to Matthew Soames. You've got a ring fence, what's going on here? until we can work out what he knows and what he can do. And then there was a change of government and they just shut it all down. For reasons we still don't fully understand, the incoming Labour government shut down Victor's experiments in February of 1936 and packed him off home to Takapuna. And the following year... Peter Fraser twisted the knife. When we questioned the poor fellow, a child could have seen that there was nothing in it. Vic would have been deeply insulted to have it described in that way, because he knew his shit, you know. I know he had no time for the Labour Party. (laughs) I wonder why. (laughs) And Victor was so pissed off by not getting his due, being an ultra uh, patriotic person that he was, that he gave the whole thing away. Victor Penny seems to have given up his interest in science and technology. He stopped his efforts at inventing new devices. He stayed interested in ham radio for a while, but eventually he threw away all his equipment and started a new career as a Presbyterian minister. Up until the day he died, he refused to speak about his work on Matsu Soames Island. So, the big question. 
was Victor Penny for real? Was he building a death ray or a radar or some other deadly top secret military tech? I don't think we have the evidence we need to reach a conclusion one way or the other. And I know some people say it's more fun to keep mysteries mysterious. It makes for a better story if we never find out what really happened. But personally, I hope the full truth of Victor Penny's death ray will be revealed one day. And apparently, I've managed to get some of the staff at Archives New Zealand nearly as obsessed with this story as me. And I'm told some of them have started fishing around in those old boxes of miscellaneous government documents, hoping to find Victor Penny's file tucked away somewhere. Who knows? Maybe they'll dig up something interesting. And if they do, well, I suppose we'll have to make a follow-up podcast. So, stay tuned. Very special thanks to my guests this episode, David McGill, Evan Penny and Professor Rodney Vaughan. Also thanks to Archives New Zealand and to Steve White at RNZ for his expertise on radio transmitters. And also thanks to the listener who suggested I take a look into Victor Petty in the first place. I'm not sure you wanted your name read out on air, so I won't say it, but you know who you are. Thank you for leading me to this weird rabbit hole. And if anyone else wants to suggest black sheep I should look into for future episodes, please feel free to email me. My email address is william.ray at rnz.co.nz. That's Ray spelled R-A-Y as in death ray, I guess. You can follow Black Sheep on your favourite podcasting app, and while you're at it, check out RNZ's other awesome podcasts. If you're interested in true crime, RNZ has a brand new series, and it's fantastic. It's called Mr Little Meets Mr Big, and it's all about an undercover police operation which was used to try and solve a murder, and the question of whether it caught the right man. Black Sheep is hosted by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin, and the sound engineer is William Saunders. The voice actors were Melanie Phipps, Phil Pennington, Sam Hollis, Simon Dickinson, Duncan Smith, James Kane, and Giles Beckford. Hey guys, this is Paige from Giggly Squad. This episode is brought to you by the new L'Oreal Paris Bright Reveal Dark Spot Serum and Broad Spectrum SPF 50 Daily Lotion. Dark spots, game over. This visibly fades all types of dark spots and visibly reduces the look of dark spots in just one week. The Bright Reveal SPF 50 Daily UV Lotion visibly reduces the appearance of dark spots and resists sun-induced signs of aging. It also has vitamin C and E to help protect against environmental damage caused by free radicals. Visit Target online and in stores to buy yours today.